Time now to have a look through your morning newspapers. Joining us, the executive chairman of Cicero Group, Ian Anderson, and journalist and writer Nabila Ramdani. Welcome back to you both. And um, let's start with one of our top stories. Lord Adonis has quit with one heck of a letter against both Brexit and the government's approach to it, Ian. It's, it's one heck of a letter. Um, 1,000 words I was uh, reading uh, just a bit earlier, Tom. Look, I mean, he, he's basically walking out uh, before he starts to vote against the government that he is kind of aligned with on infrastructure, if nothing else. R remember, this is a Labour peer, and he's going to be voting in the House of Lords against the government's uh, Brexit legislation. So he's doing it on Brexit, but he's also saying he's doing it because of what the government's just done on transport policy, the um, handing back of, uh, yet again, of the East Coast mainline uh, franchise. So he's unhappy with that, but it's more fundamentally about Brexit. I think the question for Andrew, though, um, Andrew Adonis, is, um, well, he's unhappy with the uh, government's policy on Brexit. Uh, he doesn't agree with Jeremy Corbyn's uh, policy on Brexit, which is also to come out of the single market. Um, what's he actually going to do with his own party? That's the question for me. Mm. Um, Nabila, the other top story today are the New Year honours and um, the eye, the front page of the eye that you picked out. There's obviously a lot of celebrities getting honours, um, but there is a bit of controversy in that three members of the Tory 1922 committee, who you could argue have a big say in Theresa May's own mm. personal future, mm. are being honoured. Yes, indeed. And this is very much a story effectively accusing the Prime Minister Theresa May of cronyism by uh, nominating political allies uh, for the uh, honours uh, lists this year. And, you know, this is a very common practice. It has to be said by prime ministers. They use the honour system to um, reward uh, political uh, allies and indeed for political purposes. And May certainly going to be criticised for this. But she's also appointed Nick Clegg, it has to be said, uh, for the honours as well. I suppose it's to give the impression of balance, although a lot of people are clearly unhappy that he's been honoured in this way, um, not least of all because, you know, he's not popular amongst Brexiteers. And also, people also say that he hasn't done much for his own party uh, either. And if anything, he has ma he made quite a few controversial choices, not least of all on the tuition fees uh, issue. So, to me, he's a classic small party politicians who had to build his career on compromise and has angered a lot of people by doing so. And we're already seeing the backlash on social media mm. uh, in response to the nomination. OK, um, Ian, on the front cover of the Daily Telegraph this morning, actually something which really, I think, confuses a lot of drivers, I have to say, is when you're using your mobile phone when driving, that's clear. But when you're, what if you're using your mobile phone as a sat-nav? Yeah. Lots of confusion there, lots of people actually being caught out by that. Yeah, I mean, I'm using my mobile phone as a sat-nav. I have an app. I, know, I don't know if anybody that, has a sat-nav. Um, uh, you know, allows me to get from A to B rather slavishly sometimes. I, I, I must admit, I should probably trust my own instincts. But, no, so the law at the moment is really open to interpretation. It's basically an offence to use a mobile phone rather than just to hold a mobile phone. Now, of course, using a mobile phone for a sat-nav may be an offence. According to the Telegraph, it basically appears that the police and the prosecution authorities are interpreting the law differently in different parts of the country. Not so some are, in fact, considering it an offence to be touching your phone at all. Exactly. In, in some parts of the country, that's what's going on. In other parts of the country, they're turning a blind eye. Uh, this does need to be cleared up. Mm -hmm. um, Nabila, also talking about things that are, are not against, uh, that are against the law, in fact. LSD, you've picked out an article in The Times. LSD is back in very small doses. Why? Yes. In the, well, this story uh, claims that it boosts our brains and the introduction to the story is quite blunt, actually. Acid is back uh, and the uh, psychedelic drug um, so loved during the counterculture of the 60s and the 70s is now, um, it is a, a alleged undergoing a cultural renaissance. So it takes us back to the Beatles song about, uh, you know, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which was a subtle reference to LSD or, or not so subtle after all. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but this time, uh, the story is about 
how the drug is now being used in a corporate environment uh, and it effectively the practice took off in the Silicon Valley to um, increase you know the edge of workers their effectiveness and being more productive now I have to say you know that drugs have always been used you know when it comes to artistic expression, uh, you know, uh, whether it's to do with painters or, or romantic writers or indeed uh, music. But there's, in my view, there's absolutely nothing new here about the drug being used in a corporate environment. We all heard about the yuppie culture in the 80s, you know, which effectively involved young urban professionals snorting up a coke to get them going, to keep them awake. And you don't need to be particularly creative to do dealings behind your computer screen in banking. But I mean, th th this article takes a rather lighter look at it and is talking about regular microdosing. It is worth reiterating that it is a class yeah. A drug. It's illegal to possess, to have, to And it's all, all to do with dosage. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, microdosing. You know, indeed. Yeah. So <laughs> microdosing or not, yeah. it's a class A drug. It's wrong. Um, we're going to be back in a few minutes' time and uh, with more newspapers with Ian and Nabila. Stay with us. Good morning. You're watching Sunrise. Ian and Nabila, I'm still with us this morning going through Saturday morning's papers. And um, Ian, you got a story in the, from The Express this morning. Squeeze on wages, what squeeze on wages? Brexit, what Brexit? We're drinking more sparkling wine than ever before. Well, we're either celebrating like mad or drowning our sorrows, depending <laughs> on which view you have on the world right now. But the numbers are astonishing. Really, really amazing. I mean, so we, we, we're, we're drinking 140 million bottles. We've spent 1.3 billion uh, on sparkling wine uh, this year. Uh, that was just Tom. That was just Tom, <laughs> yeah. my goodness me. Well, he really is something. <laughs> but the numbers, the, the numbers, numbers we were drinking are up massively. We were drinking just 65 million bottles only in 2013. So it's, it's, um, it's doubled, basically. It's more than doubled in the last three years. I'm joking were... aside, it does, it does have implications, doesn't it, for our future out with the EU. The UK is the EU's number one market for volume wine exports after Germany. And in return, Britain is the largest exporter of spirits in the world. So in terms of a trade deal, trade deal, whether it's all-encompassing or sector by sector, this is actually a pretty important well, sector it's for pretty us. pretty important, but this story points also to some of those French champagne brands who are buying land in that chalky uh, part of the southeast of England where you can make some amazing sparkling wine. Some of, some of the top French names are actually going to start making sparkling wine yeah. here in the UK. Okay, Nabila, uh, just to finish, restaurants snooping on diners' Facebook feeds. I mean, it, it sounds a bit shocking, but it's actually not that surprising in the new world, is it? Yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting story with a clever pun in the headline, of course, but I have to say this doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, this story is all about how uh, restaurants, uh, you know, use social media to look good, uh, to put their menu forwards and to present the decors on Instagram, for example, or using all social media to promote uh, uh, their cuisine and indeed their environment. But this uh, time, it's also, uh, it's also about restaurants actually turning the tables by going online to snoop on their guests. Yeah. So it involves, you know, trawling their guest Facebook feeds to decide whether, for example, to give them a hug or a handshake upon their arrival and to know more about their guest habits. But I have to say it affects every sector nowadays and we can check on everybody online. And it's not surprising, as you said, for service providers like restaurants are to know more about, yeah. you know, the, 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 the customers and to provide uh, the best of the service so. possible. Less of our um, likes and dislikes will be private uh, over the coming years. Well, I just hope I'm going to get a table, Tom. <laughs> no, well, they, they, they could either turn you away in advance or give you a table preferentially. Who knows? Um, Ian, Nabila, lovely to see you. Thank you for coming in to speak to us. And Happy, New Happy, New Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Enjoy. Uh, Gavin has the sport headlines for us this morning. Let's check in.